Jimmy Hocking, welcome to Australian Musician. Nice to be here, Greg. Uh, going way back, Jimmy, your, your dad was a working piano player. He was, indeed. Um, he couldn't get you into the ivories? Well, we all start on the piano. I've got two sisters and a brother, and uh, we all had piano lessons. I think my older sister and I were the first ones to get marched off to learn piano. So, so yes, he did. So we all have a working knowledge of the piano, and, um, and I... I went back and forth a little bit with the instrument, um, but you know I saw the Beatles on TV when I was a kid, and um, I'm afraid that magic spell with the guitars has never uh, dwindled. So I, I, I wanted a guitar so badly by the time I was six years old. Yeah. And once you you had your own money, uh, what sort of albums were you buying and listening to? Because Dad was uh, working as a musical director and arranger for a lot of people who were in television and theatre. And he did a lot of work with, I remember Normie Rowe coming around and Colin Hewitt, and he was even MD for Daryl Summers for a short time. So we knew the radio contemporaries, so we were aware of that. But as you say, when I got my first money, I actually remember the first record I bought was from my cousin, who was older than I, and I bought a Slade album from her for $4 sometime in the 70s, and, um, and loved that record. And uh, from there I loved, uh, I loved Status Quo, I loved Thin Lizzy and ACDC, you know, they were kind of like the darlings of the kind of, you know, boy rock uh, scene of the time. And, uh, you know, I loved all those, uh, I didn't have uh, mature tastes for rock music at the time, like I wasn't listening to Led Zeppelin and highbrow music at that time. I was listening to Hush still and, and uh, Skyhooks and the things that were just in, in our world as far as TV and, and radio goes. So I loved all that, that early 70s onward period of music. It was very formative to me and I, I became involved in more advanced ideas sort of later on. So when did you start trying to copy licks and who were the players that you were trying to emulate? Well, my story is one that doesn't really fit the rock and roll stereotype because um, I was really my father's son and I, I trailed around with dad to uh, sessions and, and he worked at, uh, at the ABC for a long time and he went in and did a lot of sessions at Shrielo and Armstrong's and stuff in St Kilda. So I went to lots of that stuff and uh, I was actually watching guitar players uh, play and um, when I first wanted to pick up the guitar, I wanted to play Beatles songs. And I remember Rick Springfield's Speak to the Sky was on the radio, so I learnt that. But Dad had like Les Paul records uh, at home. And uh, so forget the guitar aspect of Les Paul, the solid body guitar design. We had some of those records. And so I you know, was like, okay, I want to play the guitar. We've got these great guitar records. So um, Dad had a couple of things that were Les Paul and Mary Ford, and then even a couple of the trio stuff before the Mary Ford period. And that was the first time I really heard what I thought was like really out of sight guitar playing. Like it was, it was kind of, you know, it was kind of cute for its period, even with the Mary Ford stuff. But you know, all that stuff he would do. And that's kind of the that's kind of the lessons I took away to playing fast and stuff, which is how I started. I, was, I came in then through the kind of like the, the, the rock period of Gary Moore and Van Halen and all that kind of stuff by the time I was leaving school and everybody was trying to shred on the guitar. And I'd kind of already thought about it because I was trying to ape those Les Paul records and Les Paul was trying to ape Django Reinhardt. So it came from a jazzier thing, which, you know, is not a good answer for some, <laughs> some rock and rollers. <laughs> Um, so what was your first professional gig? Uh, well, I did gigs at school. I recall uh, I even played at some beads dance in the 70s with my uh, the band I was in called Black Diamond after the Kiss song. And uh, I had banged around in like just jam room bands by the late 70s. I was going to Sandy Tech by then. Uh, and the first gig I did was out of school. I think it was 80 or 81. And I, I had a band and we opened for La Femme at the Dendy Theatre in Brighton. So we did that. I wouldn't say we were a successful opening act, but we, we had a great time. Uh, and 
Uh, beyond that, our first pub gig was at the Bridge Hotel in Morty Alec. So that was kind of the, the ball rolling by then, and I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some of your early bands, uh, the Astros. Um, yeah. Tell me about those days. Well, that, uh, the Astros was formed uh, it kind of def by default out of an, an earlier band I had called the Astro Boys, which we were kind of like a just a group of friends, and we've got this band together. I, I became the songwriter because I think I was just the driving force behind trying to make a band. It was kind of, uh, and I ended up being the singer and guitar player, uh, Jim Young, Christian Milka, and Glenn Miles in the band at the time. We were kind of kids starting out, and. I didn't really want to be the singer, but we just couldn't find a singer. So I kind of assumed the role because I was writing the stuff. It was just easier. And I think I went through some changes. I, I thought we were a bit light and poppy and I was really influenced by some heavier things coming up by that stage. So I kind of, you know, um, I was the bad guy and I kind of put an ax in the band in a way. And then I reformed with a three piece uh, with uh, Greg Pedley and Peter German and we were then the Astros. And that was at the time I discovered things like uh, Aldi Miola and uh, Frank Zappa and all that kind of stuff and Midnight Oil even who were like an early, their early incarnations. And I wanted to kind of blend this idea of heavy rock with more intricate runs and things like that, a la what, um, you would hear on those Aldo Di Miola records. So Frank Zappa became my idea of putting humour into it. Aldo Di Miola became the idea of kind of this very Phrygian sounding uh, running around the guitar thing. And the Astros was born of that. So, um, so we were kind of a serious three piece band with this weird uh, art rock look about us. So we couldn't get her arrested uh, as far as um, commercial um, record companies went, but other musicians loved us. So we would play the Armadale Hotel and be full of people from other bands, even much older than I, coming to see this progressive rock uh, thing that we were doing. So it was a great time artistically, but not financially. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Spectre 7? Well, Spectre 7 was born after the Angels, uh, to we were just off air before talking about that, and. Um, I stumbled through the mid 80s doing the Astros gig and um, trying to get that working and then I started playing with a few other bits and pieces, you know, I even did some work that Dad sort of threw at me, um, I think he wanted to school me on gigs where you'd have to read a chart and things like that and I, I played in, I remember Chelsea Brown's band and I remember the Coasters came to Australia, the doo-wop band from uh, the 60s and I played for them as, as part of their backup band. So I did a few of those kind of gigs, pretty much faking my way through reading charts and um, come 88, I'd actually done some sessions, uh, particularly at Platinum Studios, and uh, Paul Kosky, who was uh, one of the engineers and producers there, he spent a lot of time in that studio, and I did sessions for him. Uh, I think that the Astros did a record there, and also, uh, um, it doesn't matter now, but a, a lot of records that they made there in those days, there'd be people on those records who couldn't play very well, particularly rhythm guitar players. And I went in overnight sometimes and replaced rhythm guitar parts on records that were um, being made where the band were running out of time to get it right. And I would go in and do night sessions and play usually rhythm guitar on, on rock and pop records. So Kosky and me became buddies and the Angels thing happened in 88. Uh, Doc and Bob had a collision on stage in the Live Line tour, second gig in, I, I believe. And um, they wanted a replacement to do a one gig. And they rang some studios, spoke to Paul Kosky, just, just out of the blue. And he said, oh, this guy that comes in and does sessions here, Jimmy Hocking, he'll do it. So um, they rang me, I thought it was a hoax. And um, I ended up at the hotel that afternoon and at rehearsal that night and on the stage the following night playing the gig. So, uh, and then after that tour, I was hot for a minute there. <laughs> so hot right now. Um, and I kind of, uh, I, I pretended I had a band and, and uh, I signed a record deal with some songs on a demo tape that I had and um, I quickly had to put a band together to do some gigs to, to exist. So that was the Spectre 7 band. Spectre 7 being a ghost, so it was like a ghost band. That was that whole idea. I didn't really have one. Um, tell me about your working relationship with JC Jason, what kind of guitar player she was, uh, what kind of friend? Well, we were really close, Josie and I. and, and the she was in the Spectre 7 band with me. Uh, we'd already had some history, you know, we'd kind of been together when we were young and and got over the weirdness of that later on in our lives. And um, we, 
uh, were kind of like coming up through the same musical worlds in some respects. She had a band called Final Outcome and, and they were kind of, uh, they were a heavier rock band than maybe the Astros, but they were still taking a, a lend of these kind of intricate runs, you know, like extended harmonies and things like that that rock bands of the time really weren't employing. So we were always friends and when I needed this band, the Spectre 7 band, uh, I was, I was actually, I think Josie and I ran into each other and she was playing me some stuff that she was working on and it just was like a light bulb moment. I said, hey, do you want to do this band with me for, like, it, it might be for 10 gigs for all I know. I didn't know how, what was going to happen. So she said, yeah, that'd be fun. We'll do that. So it kind of started with Josie and I and then uh, Bongo, Christian Milker, who I would played in the Astro Boys with, uh, he came in to play drums and he brought the bass player that he was already working with, Diddy Keys, and that became the Spectre 7 lineup for the first year or, or two. And I mean, Josie was just remarkable talent. And, and there's, this, there's this discussion that kind of annoys me about da da da, female guitar players, and it was nice that I gave her a break, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't any of those things. I, I knew Josie so well that it was, it was immaterial whether she was male or female. She was just a gun guitar player, and that's what I wanted. So she only, she came in the band based purely on our friendship, but on the fact that she was such a good guitarist, you know, and she was a heavy guitarist too, you know. So um, that was, you know, it was probably, she was always gonna go and do her own band. So I knew it wasn't gonna last forever. So we just kind of kept on kicking along until such time as I realized, you know, she was really itching to do her thing, which, so she left and I did like one more year as sort of Spectre 7, as a three piece, while she went and formed Josie Jackson and the Argonauts. So that became her next thing. Yeah. Uh, 2005, uh, you went to Memphis for the um, International Blues Challenge. When did blues come into your life? Well, I, I was running like simultaneous musical ideas for the longest time. And I always thought that was a very healthy thing to do, like, you know, because Dad played in all sorts of bands. You know, when he'd be playing in the Billy Hyde trio when Billy was still around when I was young. He'd be doing show bands, he'd be doing pop bands, just whatever. So I wasn't a guitar player. By the mid 80s, I didn't subscribe to a one vision about music. I wasn't, it wasn't a football team to me. You know, I could listen to jazz. I was interested in, I loved Neil Young. I wanted to do some folky sort of stuff. I started playing the folky clubs. I had all these ideas going along and I loved blues. I saw Stevie Ray play in, I guess, 84 when he came to Australia the first time. And I'd already had my ear on the blues because I loved Kevin Borich. And uh, Kevin was a great influence on me as I was coming up as well. Um, the early Astro Boys gigs, we would open for Kevin and he would sometimes get me on stage to play Voodoo Child and stuff in the encore. He was just the coolest guy, you know, still is. And um, so I would hear him play Little Red Rooster and all that kind of stuff. But I, you know, Kev could sing it and he could play such great sly guitar, he sounded bluesy. And when I attempted to do it, I just felt like I just sounded like some tweaky little voice, you know, from Mentone. It just didn't sound right, you know. So I think one of the big uh, um, cornerstone albums for me was the first John Mayall Blues Breaker album. I mean, it was already an old record. It would, you know, come out in the 60s, I guess. But I never heard it. And by the 80s, somebody gave me a cassette of the record, or I bought one at that shop in um, uh, Glen Huntley Road. They used to have secondhand cassettes there. And um, John Mayall didn't sound like B.B. King either. He didn't sound like John Lee Hooker. He sounded like a tweaky little white guy like me, as far as I could hear. And um, so I felt this was a uh, a very encouraging thing. So I thought, well, I could do this, you know. So I started writing blues songs, even in the Jimmy the Human and Spectre Seven Days. In fact, the title track off the record, No Turning Back, that we did, kind of started as a blues song. You can hear it's a blues riff, but really heavy. And I, oh, but nobody in the band then, no, Josie was doing her own thing by that, by that stage, uh, but the band, I was, the, the band lineup really didn't want to play blues. I, I had this blues song that I loved to play and that, for the encore, they'd be like rolling their eyes like, all this old stuff, you know. Um, and I even brought some of those songs to then uh, the publisher and record company who we were talking about doing a second Jimmy the Human album, which I recorded, but it all fell over. And I, I played them the demos of some of these songs and they were like, oh no, I thought, this is this retro blues thing is just a dead end, you know. So n nobody liked it. So I kind of kept it under wraps. And then of course the next year, the biggest album of, in Australia was Johnny Diesel and the Injectors, which essentially is a blues album. Um, 
So I was irritated and elated by that. And, uh, but I kept on doing the Jimmy the Human thing, but I was writing blues songs uh, throughout that period and I got more and more into it behind the scenes until the blues scene kind of emerged by the, you know, like the Jets, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, even you can, I've just looked at some early footage of me and the Jets and we're playing, I've obviously brought it to the band, we're playing Sunshine of Your Love and Baby Please Don't Go in the Encore, which was in my set originally. And um, uh, so I always loved it, but when it became viable uh, in the time down that I left the Jets, so that's when I thought, I'm gonna make a blues album, you know, and I just, I made this record and just sold it independently. It was probably one of the better decisions I made because it really set me with two parallel careers in a way. And that's what took me to America, you know, to do the Blues Challenge, which I won in America, as it turns out. So, um, so I, by 2005, uh, I wasn't doing the Jets and I, was spend, I spent, I did two tours in America that year. So I, I went the first time, uh, did the festival in Memphis, won the award, um, which Frank Saltana has just won too, and Fiona Boyce has, pre has also won. Um, and uh, I came back to Australia for like a month and then went back for, I think, three months and toured from top to bottom of, of the States. It was fascinating. Uh, you mentioned B.B. King. Uh, you spent some time with the great man. Well, I, yes, <laughs> so, I mean, one of those, it was just one of those things that happened almost uh, by accident, because uh, along with what I was doing in the 80s, um, playing-wise, I, 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 I got offered a job doing some writing for the ABC, and um, so that catapulted in a few different areas. They, they, they thought in their wisdom it would be good to get some independent musicians to write some of the more um, contemporary sounding bits and pieces. So I did some sessions for them and wrote a few little themes. I, I worked on a kid series uh, and a movie. I think Fame and Misfortune was the series. I think it was Kylie Minogue's first TV appearance actually in that show. She was a child. So um, I did all that and then at one point somebody, one of the producers had the idea that it would be nice to send an actual musician to interview visit traveling musicians in, to Australia. So um, I got the job and got sent, I spoke to Albert Lee, I spoke to Vince Gill, I spoke to a whole bunch of people who came to Australia and B.B. King was one of those people. So I got sent to his hotel room and uh, I was there with a queue of other journalists and I'm sorry to say, for the journalists who were there, there were people from TV Week and you know, I think the Herald and you know, people like that. So no disrespect intended to them, but they had no knowledge of who B.B. King was and how important he was to the musical landscape. And they were literally going in there and asking questions like, because he was touring opening for U2, the questions were things like, so what's it like working with Bono? And what do you think of U2's music? And like, it was just, it was beyond mundane. And so I get in there and I had my, uh, not this gold top, I had my other, uh, my other one. And uh, I took it out because they were going to take some photos. He looked at me and he said, oh, that's an old guitar for a young man. So it's 89, right? So everybody had a pink guitar with a whammy bar on it at that time, but not Jimmy Hawking, I had a gold top because I love Les Paul. And he looked at me and was really wondering about why I had such an old guitar and I was such a young guy. So we got talking about guitars and then I said, oh, oh, oh. I, I picked up the guitar and I said, oh, to, to start this interview, I'm going to play you a song. And I, I, so I picked up the guitar. I'll do it for you now. So I said, uh, well, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, think about Miss Martha King. Well, I love that woman. I ain't afraid to call her name. Played this little thing, right? So that's the first song he recorded in, uh, I think, 1947. And... Um, he couldn't believe that I knew the song. I couldn't believe it either. I had like one BB King record, it just happened to be on it. And, uh, and so he didn't want to see the other journalists after that. In fact, he sent everybody away, ordered, ordered some tea and sandwiches, and I sat with him for probably the next couple of hours and he told me stories. He, we had a little jam, we talked about guitars, we talked about Les Paul. It was just like the most incredible experience that you could possibly have. So I never tire of telling the story uh, because it was, I, I probably had 15 minutes with him originally, and, I, and I'd say I was there for like two and a half hours, just hanging out with B.B. King. 
And even in recent times, uh, one of his uh, kids, Rita King, who's his daughter, sent me a Facebook request. And I thought that was a bit, I mean, I don't know these people. And I thought, oh, that's kind of nice, but odd. Maybe it's not her, maybe it's her publicist, you know. So on his birthday, I sent her a photo that was taken of me and the great man saying, listen, I met your dad. You probably don't, you don't know me and he wouldn't have remembered me anyway, but I had this great experience with him and told her briefly who I was. And she sent me a really nice letter saying, no, she remembered the, uh, she remembered the thing, she was doing backing vocals on the tour when he was here and he came back to the gig saying I met this guy, this young guy who loved blues and had a golf club. She remembered, so look, it was really incredible to think that I had any kind of uh, impression or connection with someone as iconic as B.B. King, so it's an incredible memory. Yeah. Uh, we spoke about your time with the Angels, uh, another legendary band you uh, started working with and still do, the Screaming Jets. How did that happen? Uh, another happy accident. So uh, through the connection of the Angels, uh, I became great friends with the band and uh, particularly Jim Hilburn, who was then the bass player. Uh, uh, still are. I still call Jim my brother. And uh, when, I, when this, the Jimmy the Human thing wound up, I was in and out of their house in Sydney quite a lot. So I, if I went to Sydney, I'd stay with Jim and his partner, Christine. And uh, we formed a little, a great bond. And so some of their friends became my friends. And Aaron Chug, who's now not with us, sadly, the great man, Aaron Chug, he was managing bands and working through Grant Thomas's office. And uh, they managed a crowded house at the time. And uh, Chuggy was taking on the Screaming Jets who were embarking on their first American tour. And as Dave says, uh, they went to America and the wheels just started falling off one by one. Uh, they'd already replaced Brad, sadly, on the drums. And, uh, and Richie, who was the original guitar player for the first two and a half odd years, he had pierced his nipple and then got into a hot tub and got a staph infection or some ridiculous thing. He was very sick. And um, so when they came back, Chuggy said to me, listen, I'm working with this band, The Screaming Jets, so I'm sort of like the fix-up guy. Um, Richie's gonna take a couple of weeks off. Do you wanna do three weeks touring with this band? And I'd gone to Sydney because it was on the slab that Hilburn, uh, Brent Eccles, and myself were going to be the band for Paul Rogers, who was, was gonna to come to Australia, and we were gonna be the backing band. But sadly, he didn't come. So Chuggy knew I had time in my hands. He said, what about this band, The Screaming Jets? And I was all like, ah. Oh. I don't know, you know, that's like that band with that guy singing and spitting and, you know, I'm like this vegetarian, you know, I'm different to that, I, I thought. And um, so anyway, I went off and did three weeks with the Screaming Jets and, and you can ask Dave the same story. Within three days, Dave and I had become such good friends and, and we inhabited a very similar personality space. We were very much like each other, we discovered. And... Uh, yeah, we became uh, great friends, and I, you know, with Rosie the same, and people in the band was, you know, we all became friends. But Dave and I had a real connection, and it, Richie just never came back, and I just stayed. That was, it was a by default thing. We have an album to make, or we'll make the album. We have one more tour to do. Well, I will do that, you know. So that was, I was there till the end of the '90s before I left to go and do some other stuff. Uh, you released, uh, I, I think I counted correctly, 17 recordings of your yeah. own. Uh, that sounds right. So I argue with some of them, one or two of them are re-releases, but that, oh no, that sounds right, because there's some new things now on Blues Roulette, which would probably even bump up that, um, that figure a little bit, but uh, yeah. that's about right. So uh, the most recent, uh, To the Moon So Blue, I think mm. the acoustic blues album that you did. Yeah. Uh, where are you at, besides the Blues Roulette, we'll talk about that in a minute, but where are you at with another solo recording? Uh, all the, to the Moon So Blue took a long time to record. In fact, it wasn't really going to be an album. It was me just working through, uh, well, Josie passed away and, and, and we had some big losses, uh, you know, in my world. Um, you know, um, Ricky Vengeance was a great friend of mine and Chris Wilson and then my dad. And there was a whole bunch of people who we lost in like a 10 year period. Aaron Chug was another one. And I started writing songs about loss. It was a bit morose, but it was really just a, a thing I was doing as a cathartic exercise. And I came, looked, I sort of looked at the material and thought, there's kind of an album here, but it's a bit sad. <laughs> you know, I don't think I can release it as it is. So in the last stages of, of, of kind of just before lockdown and then into lockdown, I wrote a few songs that were deliberately lighthearted. And I thought if I could mix up a bit of like the sort of Jimmy the Human humor with the serious, the tone of these other songs, I would have a more balanced project. So I did that and, and finished it and kind of released it 
uh, as we were in and out of lockdown in Victoria. So it was a strange project because I didn't really do a launch or anything like that. I just kind of did it. Um, but some of those songs had been on tape for like six and seven years. I hadn't that no one had ever heard. So. Um, so I, I'm always chipping away with songs, but now that I'm a dad, I'm a late starter with kids, you know, I've got kids in school now, but I don't have as much time sitting up till the wee hours of the morning by candlelight stroking the guitar to write songs, I find. Um, but I'm making time and I've got projects on the way. What do you know about recording now that you didn't the first time you went into a studio? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Uh, well. Well, first of all, recording has changed so much. The first time I went to a studio, the first real studio I went to apart from one at Monash Uni and those bits and pieces was a David Briggs studio in Queensbury Street and uh, the production workshop. And the Astro Boys rolled tape and we played like two songs. I don't know that we did any overdubs. I think we just played them and then maybe fixed some things, did the vocals perhaps. And that was how it was done. We, we, didn't, we, we didn't have to know anything about the recording process other than, you know, how to stand there and do it and um, over the years of course uh, I did a, a, a couple of Jets records, the Gorilla album, the World Gone Crazy record were the first two I did and um, it was already changing you know the Astros did an album or two, we did an EP, an album and we went from uh, analog tape to digital tape during that time uh, then by the time we were doing this you know um, the next lot of Screaming Jets records Pro Tools had been born but you couldn't afford it, only studios had it. It was an unobtainable commodity at that time. So we watched all this, uh, this change in the technology and we watched it get simpler to operate because before, if you had an old Studa reel-to-reel -reel machine, you had to have a technician rebalance it and service it every time you wanted to roll tape. So you couldn't have one at home. So it was not doable to, you know, to have home recording it to a certain degree. Um, so then along comes Pro Tools and we all started to make demos that sounded better and you know I went through every recording format I had a uh, the early Tascam four track cassettes I had an eight track version they're still in the garage uh, I had ADATs uh, I had um, then the, the the brain the 16 track digital brain with an outboard desk which all those blues records those first couple uh, were all done on that uh, equipment the very first acoustic record I did was done on the 8-track cassette. So um, I wouldn't say they sounded fantastic, but I was very much a do-it-yourself guy and I wanted, I wanted to have output. I was impressed by people like Billy Bragg, uh, who were just making records because they could, that very, the Clash idea, you know, the Clash were just, you know, go, go make a record, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. And there was even some punk rock bands in Melbourne at the time, you know, I Spit On Your Gravy and, uh, and a Smears band called The Depression. And even though that wasn't my, my prime style of music, I loved the fact that they all made singles and stuff. They all, they didn't care about this high fidelity idea. They just went into some studio and rolled tape for like two hours and recorded a record. And I, and I really loved those records because I, I, I liked the ethos of it. So I, I started to listen to records differently. I started to use my ears in a different way, to look at sonic spectrums, to look at the, the stereo image, to learn about reverb and depth of field. It became a conscious thing because I could see that in my career, even in the Jimmy the Human days, it was very hard to get people in your team. And, and so for really, to, to really make it, you know, you, you have to have some talent and some songs and all of those things, but you also have, a, have to have a bunch of people that believe in your talent and believe in your songs. And if one of those co elements is missing, it's really hard to get through the melee. So I had to do as much of it as I possibly could because I had a manager who was really good for me, who believed in me, but I didn't have a record company who believed in me. I didn't have a publisher that really loved what I did. And so I had to really fight to be uh, seen and heard. So I had to learn about you know, um, I didn't have any money, so I had to learn to do whatever I could do. And, you know, Briggsy was great for me. I'd go in there and he'd master things and occasionally mix things. And I, just, and I said to him, do you mind if I bring a notebook in to these sessions? And I would just literally ask him questions over his shoulder as he was doing things, which he didn't mind. Uh, so he was, you know, a, a good source of knowledge. And um, then it became just trial and error for the longest time. You know, so I still, I've got problems with my ears now, so I don't do any mixing anymore, but I'll track 
um, everything I need to uh, as much as I can at home. I have done for the longest time and even though we re-released the 30th anniversary of the first Screaming Jets record all for one, we did all of that in lockdown and we all just, we've all got Pro Tools. We had a click, we did the drums in Queensland, it all was sent around. We all engineered our own parts and you know it's, it, it's so much simpler but we also have a better um, knowledge set about it which, which is because we're older now. Uh, you've got a new uh, Blues Roulette EP out, your, yes. your second one with Ben Wicks and Johnny Tesserero. Um, four tracks, tell me about this one. Well, you know, Ben Wicks is a great uh, doer and he, very much like I just described about creating your own destiny, you know, he's one of those guys. So he's a bassist and he, he, he runs this thing at the Catfish in Fitzroy, Blues Roulette. They have a different front person come in each week or however it runs and they just back them up. So I've done a number of them, and they also have some in-house recording gear there. They've got Pro Tools in, the, in there. So he records nearly everything that they play. And if he gets anything he thinks sounds particularly good, he sets about maybe getting approval and getting it mixed and making an EP. So I've actually done three, I think, including one I did with Nadia and Jesse. We did like a, 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 a more of a compilation of, our, of, our, of ourselves. But yeah, so Ben's, I'm really a passenger in the whole thing. He just sends me a bunch of tracks and says, which ones do you think you like? And I'll pick out four and off, off he goes. Mixing and mastering and getting the artwork done. So uh, that got launched in July. We did a couple of gigs around Victoria in July before the Jets just kicked off. Um, so it was really great we had an opportunity to do that because now the Jets is in full swing and I'm busy. Um, but because he's doing Blues Roulette, at the Catfish every week, uh, he's still there selling hard CDs. It's available for download on his Bandcamp site. So, uh, you know, I love Ben because he he's just one of those go-getter guys. He's not sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. He's like, I'm, I'm, I've got to do something. Let's make something happen. So, so it's a pleasure to play. And him and Johnny are killer players. They're great to play with. Um, Partners in Crime, what's up? Project. Well, it's a, it's a couple of buddies of mine, uh, Pete uh, Newson and Gary Brown, put this band together. Uh, it's basically a cover band. It's a fun band to do. And they were doing kind of like concept shows. They had an, an Albert show, a Vander and Young show, and various things like that. And I would be their special guest on occasion. Um, and then as things progressed, when I have quiet periods in between Jets tours, I, it became more serious than that. And I kind of uh, I'm a would-be member of the band. Uh, so it includes Peter Robertson, Robbo from Spectrum on the drums, uh, Scott Griffiths, who played in all sorts of bands, he's a great jazz bass guy, played in Braithwaite's band for a long time, and um, so it's the, the, the five of us, is there five of us? Yeah, that sounds, a little, that sounds right. And uh, so I, I come along and do, you know, classic rock guitar. Often we, we focus on Australian material, um, and they kind of have their own audience. I don't even, I don't have to do much about that. They're a slightly older crowd. He used to run a venue called the Elwood Food and Wine Bar and it was kind of like a drop-in centre for um, you know, older people who wanted to go out and see some music. So they're still the audience and they're great fun gigs to do. So intermittently between the tours I'll still be doing some of those gigs. What about bucket list projects? Things in the back of your head that may or may not ever happen? There are many of those. Um, I actually, I mentioned earlier in our conversation that I was very much into writing this kind of jazzy, rocky, you know, thing. I really would like to record some of that properly. Uh, I spoke to Jerry Pantazis about this a little while ago. I just love Jerry. And um, I think that even Scotty Griffiths is on my slab to play keyboards on it. Um, I, I'd like to kind of refine maybe some of my songwriting that I did in those days and just do it for the heck of it. I don't know that anybody will be interested in that material, but since selling CDs has become so thwart with danger anyway, you might as well do it whatever you feel like because it doesn't even matter anymore. That's my opinion. Uh, so I'm, I'm setting about setting up some sessions, you know, where I'll kick the ball off, maybe recording wise with Pro Tools and, and get the arrangements more in hand. But some of them are complex pieces and they're quite long. You know, I, I wrote in like three parts. I thought I was making a Pink Floyd record when I was young, you know, there'd be the part one, the middle part, the crescendo part. And they're quite different, but they'd all be thematically uh, um, joined together. So I may undertake that quite soon. Uh, and the rest of 2023 into 2024? Well, I'll just be wrangling kids and, uh, well, that, that's, I think, the rest of this year, for the next 12 months, I perceive the Jets will have a, 
a very busy touring schedule. Uh, we've got an album coming out um, uh, any minute, and uh, and singles uh, they're going to be staggered off that record. So we're really excited. We did this over the last. 12 months. Uh, the, the writing got started. Scotty and Paulie started writing most of this material before lockdown and then pursued uh, you know, what they had so far, some riffs and some ideas. Um, we didn't do it the same way as we normally make a Screaming Jets record, which would be maybe would be Paul was the key songwriter. He'd set, send some acoustic demos, we'd work them up together. Because of the nature of lockdown, it became more of a studio project where Scotty had a lot of guitar riffs, but they weren't a song, and then Paulie would make an arrangement out of them and add his parts, and we grew from there. But you know, we were in the studio even in the final days of that project and still didn't have vocals on, or an idea of vocals on some of the tracks. It was pretty bizarre, and I felt that was not my favourite way to go about writing a song, but having said that, the results have been really great. It's a great sounding record. Um, I can eat my words because it's not the first time I've been wrong. I remember saying that Helping Hand would make a good single and uh, it was like our second biggest record ever. So, um, so that's, that's uh, what we'll be pursuing uh, for the next foreseeable future. But already, I think Paul said to me the other day that he'd love to do another album quickly because we had too much material. We ended up with 20 or so songs that we were, were into recording. So we might have another album going uh, straight away, actually. Brother Jimmy Hawking, thanks for joining us. A pleasure.